Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we have another muscle group series. In this series, we're taking a deep dive on specific muscles for each episode, where you're going to learn the function of a specific muscle, common training mistakes, and misconceptions about the muscle groups, go-to exercises, why we program them for our clients, and some key execution cues to nail down your technique. So today's episode will cover the upper back and rear delts. Okay, so note, we are not going to exhaust these explanations or these anatomical structures. We're not going to talk about specific attachment points or origin sites. We're basically just trying to do them justice and, and do our best to give you the tools for better understanding of the anatomy and how it applies to your training in any given training session and how you're going to apply that into your sessions. Right. So getting into today's episode and a little bit um, more about the muscles of attention for today. Again, that includes muscles of the upper back and rear delts. OK, so obviously the rear delts are a muscle of attention. Also within that upper back region, we have our traps, rhomboids and teres. OK, these are going to be the main muscle groups that we're going to be looking at that make up the bulk of that upper back and the rear delts in terms of prime movers of load across the upper back. Okay. So the rear delts in terms of the functions of each one of these muscles, again, we're just going to kind of briefly touch on the, the applicable function of each muscle and how we're mainly going to be using these. Um, obviously they have many uses and different functions and, and it's very contextual and in, in what situation, which one is doing what, um, but for the ease of today and the ease of just learning these things and, and understanding the, the simplicities of what we need to, to apply it to our training. We're just going to talk about general main functions of these muscle groups. Okay. So rear delts responsible for extending and laterally rotating the arm or shoulder around the back of the body toward the midline, right? So if we think about the rear delts, we think about exercises that we would use to train the rear delts. This is kind of a good way to, to think about muscle groups is, Let's think about the function of it. And then let's think about common movements that utilize that muscle group or, or target that muscle group and kind of give you a better idea of how that muscle group works. But with understanding the anatomy, you can also get a better idea at how to improve some of the common exercises or have some different approaches towards training it, which with the rear delts, you see us doing more row variations than fly variations a lot of the time. Um, and we'll get into that later in the episode, but that muscle group, the rear delts are mainly responsible for extending and laterally rotating the arm or shoulder around the back of the body toward the midline of the body. Okay. The traps, we have three different divisions of the traps, three main divisions, right? Of the traps that, that have different functions, uh, fundamentally. So the upper traps help elevate right? So this is why shrugs turn out to be a great upper trap exercise. The mid division, which helps retract, right? Retracting the shoulder blades together, bringing everything closer to the midline of the body. This is why pull aparts and rows and pull downs that focus on retraction typically help build up that mid trap, which is a big, big chunk of muscle within that, that trap. Then we have the lower trap, which we hear a lot about in different contexts and helps depress. Okay. It helps drive down. And you can use the trap three raise for this, which is popularized by Charles Poliquin or uh, a movement that we talk more about, which is the Y raise, um, which helps train the delts as well, uh, but popularized by coach Kasim uh, from N one and really a build upon what Charles Poliquin built or, or kind of popularized back in the day with that trap three raise, but just more of an integrative exercise. And you can also get some of this lower trap in pull down variations as well. Um, so a functional, uh, more multi-purpose use, uh, and the lower trap does, does many different things, especially for stability and overall health of the shoulder, um, and strength of the shoulder in general, and kind of just helping all that stuff work well together. Okay. Next we have the rhomboids. Okay. Major and minor divisions of the rhomboids, which basically help with retraction and the rowing motion. Okay. The rhomboid major and minor, again, there's a lot of kind of nuance to these things, but there, there is a major and a minor. There is one that 
sets on top of the other. Um, but it's one of those things where they pretty much function the same uh, fundamentally. And then we have the Terry's. This is going to be the last one um, that we're going to really highlight today. And, and what we're going to do after this, if you're already a little overwhelmed, what we're going to do after this is talk about each one and kind of how they all are trained um, a little bit more specifically and then and then just more generally with different rowing and pull down variations. OK, so the Terry's here is the last one. There is a minor and a major as well. Um, the minor in a big way helping sort of rotate the shoulder um, and rotate that that arm back across uh, across towards the midline of the back as well and it's one of those muscles that are kind of in that complex that helps drive that arm around the back of the body within that shoulder complex um, and then the major it's going to aid in again adduction of the shoulder and shoulder extension so kind of again think about rowing that arm back and, and having that shoulder extension. So your, your arm driving back behind uh, your torso. And then um, if you were kind of doing a, a wingspan test, right, arms all the way out to your sides and then driving your arms back, like squeezing your shoulder blades together, um, thinking about driving your arms back around towards the midline of your body. That's, that's in a large part of what your, your Terry's major is gonna help do. Um, but it has a large shoulder extension function. And we typically see the Terry's major used heavily um, and utilized heavily in movements that we're trying to, to bias lats in, um, movements that we're trying to bias more rear delt, upper back focused things. Um, and so the Terry's are, are, are a big player in a lot of different rowing variations. And it's not, I say that from the sense of, it's not wrong to use our Terry's at all. It's great to use our Terry's, right? I think it gets misconstrued of like, no, we don't want to use that muscle, um, but it is sort of known as like sort of like the the little lat, right? It sort of functions similar to the the upper divisions of the lat in that way, and it actually lies right above the upper division of the lat uh, in terms of its structural uh, position. Okay, so those are kind of the intros. Um, so if you need to rewind or kind of go back or or anything like that on those those functions or refer back at any point, those are there at the beginning of the episode to kind of refer back to. Um, but the main thing is going to be driving the arm back into rows and pull down variations, shoulder extension, and then think about driving the arm around the back toward the midline. Um, that's mainly what these muscles are going to do today that we're going to talk about. Awesome. Well, Austin crushed it there. Um, now with this, a lot of you guys might have heard of rear delts. That's something that's commonly talked about as well as traps are commonly talked about. Um, but Alex, why don't you go ahead and dive into a little bit about rhomboids and teres and how all of the upper back works together in a sense um, and why people might not have heard about rhomb rhomboids and teres um, as much as the other two. I would say that... Um, <clears throat> Potentially why they have not heard of them is the uh, integration of, of how they're utilized within um, like the, the entire shoulder complex. And there's not necessarily exercises that are going to be targeting them specifically within the, the training as a whole. Yeah. And I think that's um, kind of what Austin was getting at. And what I really wanted to highlight here is just how much they all work together as a whole um, and how much it's something that you don't have to use all of them as prime movers. Um, it's something that they can work in tandem with each other um, and have enough volume because a lot of these muscles are very much so stabilizers um, in a certain degree of being able to work um, and work within the humerus as well um, and being able to move together and separately in those spaces. Yeah, I think that's why I explained it and, and sort of how I explained it at the beginning, right? Kind of lumping them all together uh, thanks, Sue, for highlighting that was really in a big way to show you kind of all the overlap that falls within the, the main functions of those muscle, right? Those muscles. Um, so they all kind of do those similar functions. And in terms of, of whether it's going to be more mid trap rhomboid or teres or whatever it's going to be it, in a large way kind of involves arm position and where that arm is going to be or what position your arm is in when it's driving back uh, into shoulder extension or across that upper back or around towards the midline of that that back or towards the spine rather um, and so again position of the arm a lot like we talked about in episode one of this muscle series to the lats 
again, in terms of the vision of the light you're going to train, it has a lot to do with that arm angle, right? And how that's being driven back in the row has lots to do with the the implement you choose or the accessory you choose to train that muscle group. And it's going to be the same in terms of overlap, um, in terms of the upper back and the upper back though, in my opinion, although the lat is fun to train, um, especially when you learn more how to, to bias it a little bit more and you can start to, to connect with it a little bit more and have a little bit better mind muscle connection, create more tension there. I think the upper back is one of the f- most fun muscle groups <clears throat> in terms of, of general uh, muscle groups to train for myself. It's really more of a, again, arm position matters, execution matters, technique matters. I want to preface that, but it's really more of a grip and rip sort of, uh, muscle group in my opinion. And once you get down, you know, the proper setup and, and the accessory choice, it's really just like, let's get after it. Let's, let's go to work because a lot of these muscle groups are working in tandem. They're working together you know, some pass off responsibility as you go through a range of motion, um, in a large way. Right. So that's, I think one of the most fun things about upper back training. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest things we wanted to highlight in this episode, which we'll get to is, is really the, the setup and the, the implement choice and, and kind of where those arms are, uh, coming across at the body or, or how we're pulling that, that load, how we're creating tension essentially. Yeah, I, I, I agree as it is easily one of the more fun muscle groups to train because you can get under such heavy loads. And this is oftentimes the musculature that that um, you have the most developed uh, when you don't even really necessarily know how to contract your lat and things of that nature. You you find yourself with larger traps and, and, and Terry's being well developed. And um, but you find yourself where you go into a back double by and you're like, shit, I don't have any lat to really show here. Um, but you do have some really nice upper back musculature, but you don't have any taper to really go along and density to go along with it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a fun, uh, muscle group to train or muscle groups. Yeah. And if you didn't listen to the first episode, um, one thing that we mentioned was a lot of lat based exercises, especially the machines and cables are set up in a way to not actually hit your lat. So like Alex was saying, you're going to get a lot of upper back and you might already have a very well-developed upper back when you're trying to train those lats. Um, And so it's something that we'll go through kind of arm path. um, And just like the lat episode, we're going to have a playlist linked in the show notes going over some videos we have because I know I'm much more of a visual learner when it comes to actual exercise and like executing that just like the video shows and being able to see that. So we will have that. Um, We have videos going over um, Austin going through arm angle for upper back versus rear delt. If you're doing a row, Um, we have videos that Alex has done on the cross cable rear delt fly, um, as well as doing a rear delt fly with dumbbells. I have a video going over how to do a pull down um, lat focus versus upper back focus. Um, so we have all of those videos and we'll talk about more exercises here in a moment, um, but that, but those are all going to be linked. So if you're having a hard time visualizing when we're talking about, okay, lat versus upper back, a lot of those videos are going over specific arm angle and specifically how things are altered. Um, because if one thing you're going to get out of this episode is that arm angle matters um, and how you're moving that because these are all around the scapular or the scapula. Um, It's something that a lot of this muscle function is to alter the biomechanics of the glenohumeral joint um, and being able to see that impact on the limbs and where they're positioned. So um, going over some common mistakes that often happen. Um, is going to be um, focusing too much on the scapular movement and not the limb muscles creating that force on the scapula, um, which in turn is going to kind of be that arm angle and how you are initiating the movement as you go through it. Um, And then uh, another thing would be trying to blindly perform retraction and depression simultaneously. Uh, Alex is going to make a post here soon talking about this. He had me do an upper or rear delt pull down. Um, So if you want to talk a little bit about the depression um, and retraction on that? Well, I think that this is, it goes back a little bit where <clears throat> previously, and, and and Austin and I taught this very early on when uh, physique development was just starting. We were well, really campus physique at the time. 
shout out to the uh, oh, true, true OGs. If you've been here <laughs> since then, wow, you're a dedicated individual. Yeah. But we used to teach this in the sense of, of when you were going through pulling motions, you would go into a very, very hard retraction first. And in our thought process at that time was to, to create greater stability for the lats to work, where now that we've expanded our knowledge and, and research has continued on, uh, we found that that was actually uh, painfully counterintuitive uh, to actually cause a lot of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Austin? Uh, lackluster function just dysfunction. dysfunction and i think that um you know we got away from that and now it took time it has taken a good bit of time to get away from that very rigid uh retraction and then trying to stay in that hard retraction uh to continue through the pulling motion now we move in more of a, a fluid motion of of protraction and retraction that just naturally happens as you are, are pulling the the humerus down um has been a game changer and, and certainly from a a function perspective within all of our clients Clients, um, has been significantly better. We're seeing less injury. We're also seeing better results within the development of, of lats and, and, and total upper body or uh, posterior upper body uh, musculature as a whole. So um, the, the biggest mistake is, is having that hard retraction and, and not allowing for the, the body to move fluidly like it would like to or needs to for, for optimal function. Yeah. And scapular health is extremely important. Um, if you've ever seen people with winged scapulas, um, or I've gotten scar tissue under my scapula, not only does that have a lot of dysfunction within movement, um, and within building muscle and opposing muscles as a whole, but also your look is very odd because you have these things poking out from your back and you basically have to retrain them, um, and do corrective exercises to have that back in the correct space to continue building muscle. So if your scapula is all fucked up, honestly, um, you have a very hard time building other muscles because of how much the scapula um, and its positioning and the health of your scapula goes into a lot of things posteriorly. Yeah. And I think the robotic mechanics of, of most things, right, are what we're moving away from, you know, and, and this is, this is, isn't, a, it's an attest to evolution of our careers it's an attest to an evolution of where the information is at the given time and kind of what is is generally being taught within the the space the industry right and so i mean we were on the forefront front lines of what we're, we're describing as being wrong right now right we were on the front lines of of, of sharing that information because we thought that was right we were being told that was the way to the way to kind of do it you know, and, and we saw a lot of value in, in what we thought we had there, right? But that's since evolved. We've we've learned more and more. We've we've, you know, people have evolved that line of, of thought and, and really critically thought about those those subjects and, and really critically thought about, you know, what is the role of the scapula? How is it supposed to articulate? How is it supposed to 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 upwardly rotate, downwardly rotate naturally and, and move um you know, around the rib cage a little bit more naturally and, and what muscles attach to those things. And I think in large part, again, the, anytime we have robotic mechanics, we're probably need to improve something, right? And so our body does move very naturally. Our nervous system is very, very smart and always going to be smarter than we are. And if you think about being, you know, a small child or any, really any point leading into this point, uh, point in time, especially when we're talking about upper back and, and pulling and rowing motions, like think about when you're playing on the playground, right? You're pulling yourself up, you're, you're pulling yourself, uh, pulling something towards your, towards your chest or pulling yourself up or hoisting yourself up on the playground or something like that. You were not thinking about like, okay, retract, depress, <laughs> you know, X, Y, and Z, right? You were just naturally doing stuff, right? And it, it was natural. It, it was within the, the proper rhythm of, of what that, uh, you know, GH joint that Sue mentioned is doing, but also in terms of that shoulder joint, but also in terms of what the scapula wants to do, right? And what it naturally does. And so I think from the line of thinking that we were in of, all right, let's basically use these tiny, tiny muscle groups, you know, these, uh, these rotator cuff muscles and these uh, supporting muscle groups to be a main mover. And then the the bigger muscle groups be a secondary mover, right? When that comes out of my mouth, you're you're kind of sitting there thinking like, well, that doesn't really make sense. Why would it be that way? And you're right. Like it doesn't really make any sense, you know? And 
we've since learned that and we've since thought more about that. And, and since we've started to reapply some of these more natural principles of, of how things are supposed to work and rotate uh, or, or articulate and upwardly rotate and, and downwardly rotate and do all these things that, that the scapula is naturally always done, right? So if you think about other animals, you know, other animals that climb and, and do things, like even cats, for example, like watch a cat climb a tree or, or try to climb something. They're not thinking about that. They're like just straight pulling up, pulling down, doing whatever they, they got to do. I watched my cat do this the other day, which is why I'm bringing this up. Um, it was trying to climb something in my garage. And I, I watched it essentially d jump up to a point where it couldn't reach, attach its nails to this thing, defy gravity, and essentially do an entire pull up to get it into position where it wanted to go. And I was like, that's amazing. I can't, I can't imagine, you know, lats are working there. The, the Terry's, the rom, like all the, all these little muscles in between its shoulder blades are doing so much work. Right. And those are the muscles we're talking about today. So if you can imagine your cat, if you have a cat or your dog trying to climb something or a bear or anything that climbs things, right. Um, or a gorilla or a monkey or a chimpanzee or something. So that's what we're talking about today. And, and the more robotic, essentially this tangent was about. The more robotic something is, the the less right it probably is, right? We want things to be smooth. We want it to be a continuous natural motion, and we want to we want it to have uh, fluidity uh, about it, right? And you'll notice that within our execution, how it's evolved over the years versus kind of where it was in the past. Yeah, and we've talked a lot about arm angle and how that is a common mistake. So I want to go ahead and talk about what that looks like for arm angle. Like I said, there will be videos if you are much more of a visual learner. Um, but when we're looking at hitting those upper back muscles versus those rear delt muscles, those upper back, um, it's going to be more so, let's say that you have your arm bent and it's or have your arm out in front of you and just bend it straight back. That's something where your arm is perpendicular to the ground um, or not perpendicular. <laughs> it's very parallel to the ground. Um, your humerus is just sticking straight out from your body um, and you're kind of forming a right angle there. And it's something that you're going to be pulling straight back. And then when it comes to the rear delt, you're basically going to a B duct your arm a little bit closer to your body to make more of that 45 degree angle and then being able to pull in. It's the other way around. The other way. A, -D. a, a D duct. Gosh, go. I was trying so hard to make sure I said it correctly. Uh, <laughs> a deduct. I was, I was literally thinking in my head. So how I remember them is abduction. A deduct is like if someone were to be abducted, they go away. Um, and I was thinking that as I said it, and then I was like, oh, that's not it, because a deduction is adding to your body, so getting closer to the midline. So I apologize for confusion there, but you're going to a deduct it closer to your body to me be about 45 degrees um, away from your body and being able to pull in that movement to get your rear delt. Now with saying this, we've also talked in past episodes that no muscle works in complete isolation. So the rear delt is still worked to a certain degree when you're in that upper back pool um, or that range of motion. Um, but it's something that to hit all of the fibers of the rear delt, you're going to want to slightly change that arm angle to make sure that you're firing all of those fibers um, across the board. Yeah. And uh, I'll just mention something really quick. And what I said earlier is you got to think about um, certain muscle groups as well. Uh, the back is a great example of this or the rear delts onto the traps uh, is a great example of this. But muscle groups sometimes help each other along to create more le more and better leverage for the, the bigger muscle group to take over. Right. So we think about we've used this example of the lying leg curl. Right. So when you're you're lying you know, flat on a lying leg curl, you know, face down in a prone position and your, your, you know, legs are fully extended out. The first 15 to 20 degrees is really your gastroc, your calf, basically getting the load into a position so the hamstrings can take over so they can have better leverage. Because when your, your leg is lying flat, your, your hamstrings don't really have good, good leverage to, to create tension and, and move the lower you know, part of your leg upward, right? So the same thing with the, the arm as it comes across the back or that comes across the, the back towards the midline of the spine, your rear delts in a lot of ways, as your rear delt attaches from your humerus to your scapula, it's sort of that first line of defense or first filter of, okay, our rear delt is gonna really help us get to a point where that trap rather 
that attaches from the spine over to the scapula is going to be able to create leverage and take over. So I think that calf to, to hamstring relationship is very similar to the rear delt and how it really helps us in terms of these, these big muscle groups of our back create, have better leverage to sort of pick up those, <clears throat> those muscle groups or pick up that tension as it comes across the, the back. Right. So that's where a lot of a rear delt has overlap in my opinion. And that was shown like in my physique, I know early on, like I used to have these crazy, crazy rear delts. And I, I think one, I didn't really understand how to train my lats very well. And honestly, the better I understood how to train my lats, the more my rear delts went away, <laughs> um, which was a sad day. But um, knowing how to train rear delts, I can sort of pick up that volume again. But to understand that, like when I was just gripping and ripping and pulling things, I had these monstrous rear delts. And I think in a large part, one, the rear delts are a part of a lot of different things, just like the, the, the medial and anterior delts, the front delts. Our delts in general are involved in so many, so many things, right? Um, but based on the point of me bringing that up was the the rear delts are basically getting our arm to a position where the bigger back muscles can say hey all right i got it from here thanks for you know thanks for getting it this far we got it from here sort of thing yeah so alex do you have any other common mistakes you feel like you see with an upper back or rear delt training yeah I the, the last one I'll touch on is we, we talked about the grip and rip kind of technique and, and being useful through this type of training. This, uh, within this, uh, you want to think of your, your spine as kind of a, a flagpole or a steel pole within this because a mistake that can be made is that you're kind of opening up as you're doing a dumbbell row of um, kind of like rotating your, your torso and letting your entire body kind of flail as if you're a fish out of water. Um, we want to avoid that, of, of course, and think of it more as you want to stabilize the, your core, you want to stabilize the spine uh, positioning and really um, be uh, intent-based and, and, and have great intensity through driving that arm uh, through the row, but also keeping everything else very, very stable. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And what I want to say, um, if you are a female listening to this, I know traps get a bad rap. Oftentimes females don't want to work their traps or now that we're mentioning traps in an upper back, you might be like, well, I don't want to do those exercises because I don't want my traps to grow. Um, one thing is, is that we do want to have some volume to all muscle groups to make sure that we're having general health, as I've mentioned multiple times and probably will continue to mention. Um, but it's also something that um, your trap and it growing depends on the initiation of the exercise. So it could be something that you're doing a lot of lateral raises to try and grow your medial delt. Um, but you might be initiating that with, um, taking in too much trap into consideration or using your traps to move that weight. So it's something that I don't want females to demonize trap training or feel like I don't want to do anything that's going to include my trap. Um, because a lot of of it comes down to the initiation and the execution of an exercise. Um, so the more that you listen to this podcast, watch these videos, you'll be able to get more of an idea of, okay, how was I doing too much trap training because of the way I was doing my other exercises versus I can't do anything trap related because within the traps, I know I said within a lot of the upper back, it comes down to stabilization, but the traps, I mean, the, uh, trap one stabilizes the delt and the triceps. Trap two um, stabilizes the point of rotation in the scapula. Trap three stabilizes the delt bicep teres, lat and pec tension. Rhomboid stabilizes delt teres and lat tension. So you're going to be using these or hopefully you're using these to stabilize these muscle groups. So that's also to say that if you feel um, a little bit of um, like sensation, when you're doing these other exercises and you feel that in your upper back, that's also not inherently bad because those are there to stabilize those other movers um, as you're going through. As we've talked about the humerus a lot and how different muscle groups attach or originate at the humerus, um, it's something that 
because of those movers of the humerus, a lot of these are stabilizers. Um, so like I said, within your pec and your lats um, and those movements. So it's okay to feel those muscles moving to a certain degree and those other exercises. It's okay to train them as well. It's just making sure it's a well-rounded approach and you're actually training what you're intending to train. Because I know that as a female a few years back, I might have been listening to this and been like, well, I don't want no traps. Traps are bad. I don't want those a part of my my uh, physique, but being able to see what that looks like as a full picture instead of just being afraid of training traps. Yeah, I've had clients in the past, uh, female clients more specifically, where they had um, these incredible rear delts, these incredible teres, these these things that go f- basically attach from the the humerus to the scapula, or, right? So they're that sort of like, if we break it up into two sections, we think of the humerus to the scapulas, <clears throat> section one, the scapula to the spine is section two. She had everything that was so sculpted and, and so strong from section in section one, where, but we also have to consider section one depends on section two in a lot of ways, right? Because it acts as an opposing force on the opposite side of the scapula, right? So if something's pulling in one direction on the shoulder blade or the scapula, we need something to oppose that force on the other side to allow, not only allow for greater tension to be had, but also for function, right? For for stability and, and, and general function of that entire region of the body. So, you know, she individually had more dysfunction in her shoulder. She had a lot of shoulder dysfunction. She had a lot of upper back pain. There were a lot of things that didn't quite work well, right? She, she couldn't fully retract her, you know, into a position. Um, and there was a lot of you know, weakness within that mid trap in those, those traps in general. And that wasn't good. You know, that was something that, that we had to work on a lot and and she's had to work on a lot over, you know, over the time. So, uh, and I think in terms of building up the strength on, on all fronts, right. And Sue mentioned this, like, just because we don't want to build something up and be quote unquote bulky there doesn't mean we shouldn't train it. Right. And now volume allocation is a big thing. We talked a lot about that in the past, right? Uh, in other episodes where, you know, you don't want to be doing probably 20 to 30 sets of, of something you're not wanting to grow a lot. That's probably not a good idea. But, you know, anywhere from, you know, four sets, eight sets a week, you know, upwards of, of maybe 10 sets, depending on how close to failure they are and how hard they are, you're not going to like, you know, but be busting out of your shirt, you know, doing a like pull aparts and stuff just to, to kind of stimulate that tissue, create a mind muscle connection, create some muscle tone back there. Um, and I, I say muscle tone in, in reference more to the nervous system than our normal use, use of the word tone. Um, but think about like sort of a, a consistent hum, right? So a consistent like connection to that muscle group from the nervous system. It's kind of like constantly always a little switched on right? So it's ready to work. It's, it's, it's there. It's helping your posture. It's helping you stabilize things, uh, things like that. Right. So more of neural tone, if, if you want to consider it to be that, but yeah, just because we're training a muscle group doesn't mean it's going to grow or it has to grow. Um, and, and don't neglect muscles that play such a big role in your, not only your posture, but just every part of your training experience, right? You think about any other movement that involves the stabilization of your spine and your shoulder blades, that's a lot of movements. So um, that's going to involve all of these muscles we're talking about today. And it's important that not only we understand how to, to work these muscle groups and, and properly put, place tension on them, but also we understand that we have to train them. We need to train them for, for general function uh, and to be sure that everything is working properly. Yeah. So let's get into our favorite exercises. And as we're getting into that, um, we briefly mentioned previously that we do more rows um, than flies. So Austin or Alex, do you want to touch on why that is? Uh, in terms of, of rows, I, I think that you're going to be able to place more attention and, and be able to put more load on the tissue. Um, and our intent is always going to be make it as... as um, the most efficient time in the gym, as well as uh, getting the most bang for our buck out of exercises. So we found within our, our time working with clients that rows are going to be more beneficial from a growth perspective and actually training the tissue through uh, different ranges. But it does give us a, a little bit better of an opportunity to, um, you know, get after it. 
Um, just really quick to, to add what to Alex said there, um, you know, we can think of the the rear delts are also broken up into different divisions, really small divisions, right? Not quite as substantial as like the trap divisions. Um, but just for example, the medial delts have many divisions of the medial delt, right? So all these things have different divisions in and of themselves and the way that they're, the musculature works and pulls and, and all that stuff, right? So think about, like we talked about the lats, if you listen to, to uh, episode one, those bigger divisions that dictate how those the arm is moving around the, the back there, the same as the, with the rear delt, they're just much smaller, right? So kind of more of a micro scale instead of a macro scale. But with more fly variations, traditional prone rear delt flies, traditional like pack deck rear delt flies, things like that, we're only training or putting one or, you know, maybe one of those divisions in a best position to, to be able to place tension on them, right? Maybe one or maybe two of those divisions. And what's been found within those rows, it just, the, if you look at it, and this is actually a picture in my book, it's in the, the rear delt section of my book, um, there, I, I actually show how and why it makes sense to do a row for rear delts because it allows all of the divisions of that rear delt to be lined up for tension to go through each one of them very efficiently and very effectively, right? And it has to do with arm angle in a big way. And, and Sue touched on that with it and kind of generally that 45 degree angle, um, typically a place where you get the greatest amount of shoulder extension. So we go over that actually in the video, Sue and I on YouTube, upper back versus rear delts. Um, so if you want to get on YouTube and look at that video, um, definitely do that. But again, it comes down also to division. And as Alex mentioned, um, the efficiency and effectiveness of how we're training those muscles, you know, if we can kind of two birds, one stone it sort of thing, like let's do it and let's maximize it. Yeah. And this doesn't mean that flies have zero place. Um, they do have a benefit, especially when it comes to um, volume or just how much output you want someone to do with a fly or with anything where your arm is extended, you're going to be doing less load than you are going to be when your arm is bent. I mean, the, the term is called your moment arm. But if you think about holding a dumbbell and just holding it close to your body versus holding it out in a lateral raise, it feels a whole heck of a lot heavier out in a lateral raise. That's hence why we don't carry things so far away from our body. It's harder to do that. And it's placing more load because it's further away from the joint, gravity, all that jazz. Um, so there is benefit in doing it, but you will do lighter loads than you do with rows, which can be the benefit because it might not be, you might not want to have as much output um, for someone, but still get a little bit more volume for a rear delt without putting as much output of putting them into a row situation. But some of our favorite exercises, I know mine was the upper back pull down. I absolutely love that. Um, also love myself a good rear delt row, um, seated or standing. And standing could be termed as a face pull um, and being able to go through it um, in that. And then uh, I also really like the rear delt pull down. But what other exercises do you guys have? I really, really enjoy a single arm dumbbell row. Um always and forever will be my favorite upper back movement for sure. Um, and then I, I enjoy the, the rear delt cable horizontal row. I like to pull apart. I don't know. It's a, like I said at the beginning and, and Austin uh, agreed was that this is just a, these are fun muscle groups to train as a whole. I think that they can certainly be overworked, especially within more of our, our male athletes where we are, or our female athletes who are having a more of a upper body bias, uh, where you are just going into uh, protraction and retraction, uh, pretty consistently throughout the week and you can get quite a bit of fatigue. I think that the, the place for me personally, where I find the most fatigue, um, is going to be in my rhomboids actually, in terms of, um, just having a little bit too much work to them because it's just such a, it's so intertwined in so many different components and the, and the Terry's as well, but, um, that it, it, you can have a little bit too much load, certainly, um, from a frequency perspective and just being cautious of that as you're, uh, scripting out your training for the week and, you know, phases in, in the future. Yeah. And that's a great point as well. And to, to what the, another point that Sue made was a reason for a fly versus a row is, you know, for a row is by nature an integrated movement, right? And a row where we're going to be 
training the rear delts spe more specifically or placing more bias towards the rear, de rear delts in that row that's going to have the rhomboids involved in that. It's going to have some of the teres involved in that. It's going to have some of the traps involved in that, right? And so, and also as more main movers, primary movers more so than secondary, right? So where the, in a fly variation, more like a, a prone uh, dumbbell rear delt fly or something like that, or, or a pec deck machine rear delt fly or something like that, they're more of just general stabilizers. There's more of just like, they're kind of in an isometric and they're just kind of like holding their breath essentially is what, how you can kind of think about it. But um, so that's another usage of of that. But also I wanted to, to also highlight with, with you guys mentioning all those exercises, I can't add any exercises. Those it's are impossible. pretty much all the good ones. <laughs> so what I, will, what I will do is just mention the lat, if you did listen to episode one, the lat was a lot more specific in a lot of ways in terms of the angles we needed to train them at. Now the upper back, we have specific angles to, to really like maximize things, I think, where things make the most sense. But that isn't to say that there is a specific angle for each and every single one of these that you have to hit, right? There's so many angles in between like a, what would that be? A 90 degree angle. Let's say if you're just, you know, making a T, arms straight out, measuring your wingspan sort of thing, all the way down to the point of adduction where your arms are to your sides, right? That's a long or a, a large gap of how many angles we could train that those muscle groups, if that makes sense. I don't know if you guys can articulate this a little bit better, but, I'm, but basically what I'm trying to say is there's so many different angles and, and places for your arms to come come back across your body into shoulder extension and and to use those muscul use that musculature and use those muscles in different ways and in, in, at different angles because they do pull in so many different ways and each one of these muscles have different divisions right it's not that they're just a block of muscle and it's like it only works this way right and if you look at if you google any of these upper back muscles or, or get an app um that talks about anatomy we like i really like complete anatomy um so if you go to the, the app store it's called complete anatomy you can actually get it on your desktop as well i have the mobile version and um the desktop but we'll actually link that in the the show notes but if you basically use that app or, or google you know upper back anatomy or back anatomy you're going to see that all of these fiber angles, the way that these muscles are running are all at different angles. Some are upward, some are more downward, some are straight across. And all of that, you know, is going to make a difference in which have more bias or, or results in more tension being placed on them based off the angle that we're pulling at, right? So it's important to, to diversify that, diversify your angles, diversify your exercises in a lot of ways. Um, and you'll see that upper back has a, has a good array of exercises that we, we like, you know, the lats were pretty, um, narrow in terms of, uh, the, the exercises we loved and we would recommend, or we use with clients, but the upper back, there's a lot. And it's seemingly an endless list of, of productive and effective exercises to train the upper back. So understand that as well. And again, I think in each one of these episodes, I'm going to mention paralysis by analysis, um, it's not about being perfect. It's about being better than you were yesterday, right? It's about understanding more about anatomy, understanding more about what we're trying to get accomplished in a given session uh, over being perfect, right? We're not throwing out everything you've ever learned. We're adding to it. We're integrating it. So that's all I wanted to mention. Yeah. Uh, last few things I want to say are about grip, because I know we talked about being a neutral grip throughout lap movements. Um, within upper back movements, we can keep that pronated grip, um, and we can use that um, that bar that you always see for lap pull downs, that straight across bar that's slightly bent on the ends, but you will keep more of a pronated grip, um, which if you don't know what a pronated grip, it's basically going to be an overhand grip um, and being able to grip the bar that way. Um, within rear delt, it is nice if we can have a semi, semi pronated grip um, because it would be very hard to keep a pronated grip and like still row in that 45 degree angle. So we do want a semi pronated grip. So we do have videos going going over how you can kind of hack some of your gym equipment. Um, but it's something that the more stability you can have in these 
uh, attachments is going to be very helpful because there are so many muscles working together. Um, it's very, very nice to have more stability. So for example, uh, we have the short bar by prime and we have the rotate handles. Absolutely love them. Use them for a ton of exercises. For rear delt rows, I prefer if we just use the four in one by prime because I'm not trying to stabilize multiple things within the attachment and then also trying to stabilize uh, my upper back and then trying to still row back and get the most output that I can. So it is something that the more stability you can have within those attachments, the better. But it is something where overall upper back can be a more more pronated grip, where rear delt is going to be a semi-pronated grip. And within rear delt, um, something I wanted to mention was your forearm uh, angle. So while you might be at that 45 degree angle for your upper arm, it's something that your forearm, you want to I want you to think about this. It's not going to be a strict rule that it specifically has to keep your wrist and your elbow in line, but you want to think about outward intent when you're thinking about rear delt. And a lot of times when I get videos from clients, they'll be rowing in the right movement, but they'll be bringing their arm pretty close to their um, anterior shoulder. So if you're thinking about rowing back in that 45 degree and having your fist towards your um, shoulder and your chest versus having it out more um, like in line with your elbow. That's the difference that I'm talking about there within your forearm um, positioning to make sure that you are getting that outward intent and getting all of that rear delt as you are pulling. And, and with that, it's going to be your body's natural mechanism to pull that cable closer. As Sue talked about, it's, it's the, the body wants to make it as easy as possible on itself and use as much musculature or, or use the, the muscle that's going to be the strongest. Thus, your, your traps and everything in the uh, upper back are going to be significantly stronger than your rear delts. Thus, uh, mechanically, it's going to want to just pull directly back where you're going to have to really train yourself to drive outward first. Um, and once you get the, the technique down and then spend time within the repetitions and practicing, you're going to feel a lot better with it. And semi-supinated is a great, just to be an addition for Terry, semi-supinated is a great Terry's uh, position for your, for your wrist or in terms of attachment. And again, the four in one bar by prime, we always talk about that one because it's so versatile. Um, so if you go to, you know, prime fitness, the, the link will be in the show notes, but prime fitness USA, um, they make a great four in one uh, bar that allows for basically you, most people understand, or most people have seen the mag grips, MAG, and basically this four in one bar is a better version of that, those grips, but also it's four of those bars all in one, because you can rotate the, the hand position into a pronated, semi-pronated, neutral, and semi-supinated grip, right? Which is very versatile, especially if you're a personal trainer, you have clients, or you're training yourself. Uh, it's very versatile to just take one bar to the gym and be able to train pretty much your entire upper back, um, which is a, a great one. But um, I'll just kind of end off everything here. Uh, we may have a few extra notes, but I, I wanted to end this episode as well from similar to how I ended episode one, which is going over some execution cues to help nail form and technique, right? So uh, I, I think that was a good way to close out the last one. And uh, I'd like to do it again in, in this one. So again, body position and setup will make or break everything. So again, if you are a visual person, please go to our YouTube channel, watch some of these videos uh, that'll be in the playlist. And again, it's, it's so important that we get set up right, because if you're not set up right, you're going to be fighting yourself the entire rep to try and feel the muscle you should try and feel. But if you're set up properly, you really should be able just to set yourself up, get set, be in position and go right? It should be there. And then creating stability and tension in the torso and work to maintain that throughout the set, right? So stability throughout the torso, again, this doesn't mean, a, you know, really rigid or, or perfectly neutral spine or anything like that. It just means tension or creating stability and tension in the torso within those, uh, those core muscles within those abs, again, kind of talking about those, the compression of the abs, um, just like Dwight was going to punch you, right? Um, and brace for that second, that second blow. But it's one of those things where creating that stability can really help the output of the exercises that we're doing. And then when training with cables, a good solid base or foundation goes a long way. So stagger your stance, brace the abs, create stability and maintain it. Just like I kind of the last point, but just building upon that, your foot position 
and a stable base underneath you is a good idea. So if you're a person who trains in flip-flops or Crocs and you can't really get a good grip, like wear normal shoes. Um, and <laughs> I have never understood that, but wear normal shoes and get a good foundation or good base under you, especially for, for cable variations of these, these, uh, rowing and pulling movements, because it's going to matter and it's going to come into play when we're, we're looking to create tension and, and sustain it throughout the sets. Perfect. Well, I think that's all I had. Cool. We done. Well, thank you guys so much for listening and stay tuned for the rest of the muscle series um, as we break down each and every muscle group like we have done for lats and now upper back and rear delts. So we can't wait to see you guys in the next one.